One, two, three. Coming to you from the Indian Media Production Studios. It's three dogs and a dude. Hey everybody, Tobin Acevedo here, your host with Three Dogs and a Dude. Have a extremely intelligent, highly respected guest on for you guys today. You guys are just gonna be blown away here. Um, another Wichita product, um, straight out of North High in Wichita. Uh, made his way through Coffeeville Community College and on to the Ohio State University. So everybody, please welcome into the studios um, remotely. Uh, we have Jamie Sumner with us today. Jamie, welcome aboard. Thank you so much. I appreciate the uh, appreciate the intro. I didn't need you to get, you need to do all of my intro. That was awesome. Hey, I am for hire, voice for hire. I have a face <laughs> for radio. So if, I can if you need that, I, I'm here for you, brother. I can relate, so, I've been told that. Yeah, you and I could scare the buffet owners a little bit, and um, yeah, we're definitely built for radio, not TV. Yep. But you never know. There's always a niche market for big dudes. Big dudes are back I mean, in style. I, I'm, I've said that for years, but I think it's coming back around. So we may be onto something. Well, you know, we saw last night there were some big dudes that could move last night on that game. So <laughs> yes, there was. I'm glad I played when I played, and not now because probably wouldn't see the field very much. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't buy that for a second. So, so Jamie, yeah, um, Wichita, you know, three dogs and a dude based here in Wichita, Kansas. I love having guests with local Wichita ties and connections. I know you kind of have, have escaped a little bit and are just kind of in the outskirts down there in the Oklahoma world now. But, um, you know, North High grad, North High alum. I'm personally not a North High alum, but um, I've always kind of been envious of how proud the North High family is. Yeah, you know, I, um, so my grandfather taught at North for 26 years, 27 years. So I kind of was born into that family. Um, I was actually, I grew up, I live in the Heights District. And I just was, that wasn't what I wanted. You know, like I said, because of my grandfather and because of the memories I had when I was a kid, I wanted nothing to do with that. No offense to, to Heights, but I just was like, man, I want to go to North. And it's funny because when I coached, I, I went to North one time to look at some kids and talk to some kids. And the football coach at the time said, he goes, you know, you guys from North High are different. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you guys carry yourself. Different. It was the pride and the, you know, the, the respect you have for this place. He said, I don't see that everywhere. And so that it kind of just, you know, it was kind of one of those things to hear somebody say that it was like, Oh wow. Like that's, that's a great compliment. That's a, you know, that's a great thing to hear. And, and we definitely are proud. And uh, yeah, it's uh I, love, I still love Wichita. Obviously, don't I don't live there anymore, but I try to get back as much as I can. My family's still there, so a bunch of friends, obviously. So I still try to – I still it's still home to me. I'm just currently living somewhere else right now. So, Well, we appreciate you giving us a heads up when you are coming in here because the north end gets a little rowdy um, <laughs> when, when Jamie's rolling into town. Um, I know there's a few cats that uh, like to uh, give you a little bit of a hard time about that. So, yeah. But, it's free therapy. Facebook becomes free therapy. So I always try to give a give everybody a heads up. Hey, I'm coming into town, so they can either you know clear their schedules and come hang out, or or make other plans and get a, try to hide from me. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I always I always like I always like you know the the social media fun is I, that's something I always have a lot of fun with. So you're telling me you could have actually been one of those dudes up front blocking for me at Heights there for what a year. You yeah, it would have been 92. Yep. So you're two yeah, years so, older. So yeah. You, your sophomore year, I could have had. Well, yeah. You could come have on, had man. Me. Here's what I'll tell you, though. You, what you need to do is talk to James Espinosa, who was our quarterback at North, and he was a senior. And yep, he swears yep. to this day that I didn't block anybody my sophomore year. So, and he's not completely wrong. He's, you know, I, I missed a lot more than I made my sophomore year. That's for sure. There was, uh, any aches and pains that he has to this day, I'm probably partially responsible for. Well, James and I go way back from the baseball days. We grew up together. Uh, okay. Great cat. It was, it was always fun going to battle with him and you guys. And I know a lot of you guys over there at North with, you know, we had uh, Josh Jackson. You had uh, Derek LeMunyan. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you guys had some dudes. We definitely did. It's, uh, it's crazy to think we weren't more successful with a lot of the talent we had. You know, it's just, yeah. I look back on those years and I'm like, how did how are we not better than what we, you know, what our record showed? Um, but we weren't. And it's, uh, but it's, I think the neat thing about Heights and, and North is there's a lot of overlap. 
There's a lot of people that know each other, you know, similar. Either we grew up together, we played Little League together, we you know, went to the same parties on Friday nights or, you know, something. I mean, it just seems to be a huge connection there. So that's something I've always liked. Wait, you went to parties? What are, what are you talking about? I don't know what these parties no, I was, are. Yeah, I was told about them, actually. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. My mom and dad may listen and I'll be in trouble at 48 years old. You know, it's funny. I learned a lot of parties that I missed, actually. Um, I learned about a lot of them at my 20-year reunion. They were all talking about, oh, this party and that party. And I was like, when was this? And I call it was after this football game. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I had a concussion that night. I don't think I went to any parties. Oh, uh, so, yeah. I, I could have used you at, at Heights High for a year and then let you go back to North. But, you know, I'll, I'll forgive you, brother. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'll forgive you. I, I, yeah. We'll get in. Maybe maybe next time you come on, we'll, we can have uh, Mike Watkins come on with us and maybe talk about uh, kick returning techniques. Mike is... Um... He was one of the fat. I mean, even when I moved on and played at higher levels, Mike was one of the, he's also a really good friend of mine. I actually saw him a couple of weeks ago, but Mike's still one of the fastest guys I ever played with. I mean, just yeah. unbelievable speed. So yeah, that was the first time I remember ever, you know, just blocking for somebody. You didn't have to give him much. He could uh he could always make something out of nothing. So yeah. Yep. He always thought he might have thought he was a little bigger than he was there at a certain point in time on a kickoff fire call, but we'll get into that <laughs> later. But um, yeah, so, so t tell us what took you to Coffeeville. Um, you know, junior college football in Kansas, a lot of people may not be familiar with the Jayhawk Conference and the crazy amount of talent that that is here and just the battles and the dudes that have come through there. Uh, how did you end up landing on Coffeeville? So I, after my junior year, I was a pretty, you know, I was a pretty, pretty talented and pretty they had high expectations um, I was I was pretty visible to the college recruiters at that point um, a lot of people were gonna you know supposedly gonna offer me and those kinds of things um, senior year did not go as expected we went one and eight um, there was I think we finished the year with you know the year before my junior year we had 20 some seniors a senior year we had like three or four you know so from a leadership standpoint from a talent standpoint we took a pretty big dip um, things didn't work out the way they were supposed to. Um, if you know, to your point, if you know anything about junior college football in Kansas, it's one of the most highly respected junior college football conferences and basketball, for that matter, uh, conferences in the country. And so I had had teammates uh, like you had as well, you know, teammates that went and went that route, and um, it just became the best option. Um, one of the things that was said to me during the recruiting process um, <clears throat> was, you know, well, who's recruiting you? And I said, well. Fort Hayes State and Emporia State and, and some schools like that. And uh, Coach Geeson from Coffeeville, who was recruiting me at the time, he said, well, is that, was that, is that your dream school? And I said, no, I just want to play college football. And he said, but where did you dream of going to school at? Well, it was, you know, the OUs, the Nebraskas, the K-States. Those, those are the schools I wanted to go to. And so he explained the way junior college work. And he said, you know, look, don't, don't give up on yourself. You know, you have some talent. You have some ability. There's some things you need to do differently. But we feel like if you come here, you'll be able to make that, you know, make that jump. And so um, that was the first thing. And then the second thing was I was recruited as a defensive lineman. All the big schools were recruiting me as a defensive lineman. Um, Coach Geeson was very point blank. I will never, I mean, this, this literally, you know, this one conversation literally changed my trajectory and my career as he said, Hey, look, you know, if you want to play D line, that's fine. Um, you'll be an average defensive lineman in college. You're not fast enough. You know, you just, you don't run well enough. Um, but if you play offensive line, you'll be above average. You're, you're a great athlete for an offensive lineman. And so um, that's kind of what started the process because I was like, okay, and I played offensive line in high school. I didn't, I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it at all, but it was one of those things where just the more he talked and the more he showed me examples of guys that had made the switch and made the, made the, uh, you know, kind of made that change. I was just like, you know what? He's right. Like, I'm not a great, I'm not a great D lineman. I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty average. And so, it took some, you know, it obviously took some introspection and took some looking at myself, you know, candidly and, and the best thing that could have ever happened. I actually, you know, the other thing that's I always kind of think back on is when I was a senior in high school, we lost our last, our last game. I'll never forget. It was a South high school. We played the East. Um, it was icy. We lost the game. I sat on the back of a bus in the fall of 1991. And I looked at two of my best friends and I said, I, I'm never going to play this game again. I'm done. I don't want to play this game anymore. I was so, I was so miserable at one and eight and, and just, I knew the scholarships were gone and those things that I told myself I would never play again. I'm done. 
I guess I thought I was going to play basketball because, you know, there's, there's a huge need for slow, non-jumping white guys in basketball. So um, that can't shoot. You get 5,000 a game, man. I mean, come on. I, yeah. Now I get my, I used to get my money's worth on the 5,000. There's no question about that. Um, but the, you know, the idea of, of that's where my mind was as well. So it was kind of a, just a whole from the end of football season through the recruiting period, there was just a whole kind of switch in my mind that had to happen. Um, there was a maturity that had to happen. And there was a lot of pieces that had to happen um, to get me to where I got to. But yeah, Coffeeville obviously at the time was coming, was a year removed from a national title. Um, you know, and it's still to this day, one of the winningest junior college programs um, in the country. And so it was just, I had some, some high school teammates that were there um, as well, but an amazing experience, um, you know, ended up being just a, a great it was a great thing for me and what I needed. You know, I needed to get away from home. I needed to go, I needed to go learn how to work. I needed to learn how to focus. I mean, there was just a lot of things that kind of had to happen and they did. And uh, yeah, completely, you know, I'll never, I'm very proud of my career. I'm very proud of what, what transpired at Coffeeville, Kansas for sure. Nice. Nice. They still let you into town. Oh, all the time. Yeah. They, I, you know, I stay involved. I try to help with recruiting and I try to, I, they usually ask me to come up and speak a couple times a year and those kinds of things. So yeah, I try to stay in, it's from where I live, it's 50 minutes. So I can, nice. you know, there's, there's been, you know, there's been plenty of days I've, I've, uh, you know, had to sneak away and go maybe watch practice or go run up there. But it, yeah, it's, it's, um, they still let me back in. And I think most of the cops and the people that used to not want me to come back to town have, have retired. So I'm good now. Most of the teachers have left from when I was there. So I think now you're dealing with their kids, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's awesome. So great outstanding career at, at Coffeeville. Um, I've seen the statistics and, and, you know, seen what some of the, your coaches had said about you. Um, what, what was the, the tipping point in the decision? I know you were recruited pretty, pretty heavily out of there. I would have to guess, um, you know, being, um, Jayhawk lineman of the year. Um, you know, that's, like I said, for those that aren't familiar with Jayhawk football, um, Kansas Jayhawk conference is, I mean, top two, top three country in the country, as far as junior oh, college easily. conferences. Yeah. Easily. I mean, year in, year out. Easily. You know, um, the kind of the tipping point was I had a, you know, like to your point, I, I started both years. Um, at the end of my sophomore year, I, there was a lot of attention. Um, being placed on me. I was a preseason All-American. I ended up being an All-American, second-team All-American, and some things that won some awards like that. Um, the actual way that I got recruited, but you know, I ended up at Ohio State, obviously. Um, I had between 35 and 40 Division I offers. So two years before, when I leave North High, I'm, I'm sitting on zero offers. Two years later at Coffeeville, I come out of there with between 35 and 40, probably, um, offers all across the country. I mean, from Syracuse to... I mean, North Carolina to UCLA to Ohio State, Arkansas. I mean, there's, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, it was one of those things where I I was really interested in Arkansas. It was close to home. It was a good conference, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I went in to see some of my coaches at Coffeeville one day, and I actually walked in on them, and they were, they were goofing off in the office watching Caddyshack. And so I was kind of giving them a hard time, like, oh, you guys better be working and this and that. And one of my coaches... Uh, Coach Young, he said, hey, what are you going to do? You know, what are you thinking about? By this time, I'd taken, I think I'd taken three of my visits. It was pretty much going to be my three, what it really came down to, it came down to Arkansas, Ohio State, and Virginia. And I was kind of explaining it to him. And Coach Young just looked at me and he said, you don't go to Ohio State, I'm never talking to you again. And I was, you know, I kind of laughed it off. I thought, oh yeah, ha, 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 you know, and he, and he just gave me that look, that coach, you know, we've all, we've all been given that coach look in our lives. Um, he gave me that look and, and I could tell he was serious. And I kind of remember just standing up and like starting to walk out of the room and he, and he looked, I looked back at him. He looked at me and he gave me that look and he goes, I'm serious. Talking out of the coach's office, like, man, like, what am I missing about, you know, about this opportunity? And you know, I was like anybody. I, when I was a kid, I watched the Ohio State-Michigan game and some things like that, but I truly didn't understand how special that opportunity was um, until he kind of he kind of put the pressure on me. Then I went back and kind of looked at some things and talked to the coaches again and talked to some people that I trusted, and it just made sense to go to Ohio State. 
And obviously it worked out awesome. It was an amazing opportunity now, especially looking back right now, obviously it worked out great, but um, that's really how it came to be. A, a coach kind of kind of told me, you know, like a coach that I love and to this day, I love this man to death and, and respect him. And, and so for him to give me that kind of push and, and then, you know, and there was, like I said, there was other people that, that kind of co-signed it or, or, you know, backed up what he said. And I just thought, you know what, I'm, I'm there must be something to this. And so I, and I, you know, there was another part of me too, that, I always told myself I wanted to go play against the best. When I signed at Ohio State, they were 10-1-1. One, and one. They were coming off a Big Ten championship, number three in the country, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just like, you know what? I'm, I always told myself I'd, I'd go compete against the best. Here's my opportunity. So I'm going to go do that. And, and obviously, like I said, now, you know, 20-some years later, it's, it looks like a great decision. At the time, it was just it, – it made sense then, too. Yeah, you look brilliant 20-some years later. <laughs> I mean, genius move. I do. I, you know, thank God for coaches in those looks, right? No. And you know, it's funny because it's, um, I, the, the arrogant flash confident side of me, 20 year old side of me wants to say that well, I'd have been successful wherever I went. That's not necessarily true. I think I went to a situation into a, a program that, you know, it was, it was the best case for me. The, it pushed me, it made me grow. It made me stretch. I figured out how to work again. I mean, there was just, there were so many pieces to it that I don't, I mean, again, I don't, it was just such a great decision then and now more so now, but especially then no question. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Appreciate you sharing that. So, you know, I never had the chance to do it. I can, I've dreamed it many times, but dude, what's it like running out of the tunnel at, at the shoe? to, you know, 92,000 plus screaming fans. And I know they're all screaming for you. I mean, they were just all were all had number 72 <laughs> signs. But what, what's that feeling like, man? The first time you ran out that tunnel. So here's the funny part. The first game we played that year was uh, we actually played at a neutral site. We played the Pigskin Classic out in Anaheim. And so then we played a game. We were away at Washington. And so the first game at home was against Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we beat them. They weren't very good. Um, and we came back and we played uh, University of Houston, 52 to nothing. We blew them out. So you can imagine the crowd, you know, it's awesome. And the crowd's cheering. They were the best thing ever. Um, and then a couple games after that, I think we were four. We lost at Washington. We were like four and one. We come home to play Illinois. And if you're not familiar, in the Big Ten, every game has a trophy attached to it. So there's mm -hmm. like Paul Bunyan's ax. There's the old Oak and bucket. There's all these different, you know, uh, trophy type games um, that they play. Well, university of Illinois and Ohio state, it's called the Illabuck. It's a turtle shell. And it's a, you know, it's a trophy you get to keep and this and that. And it had been kind of tough. Coach Cooper had struggled. Ohio state had struggled against Illinois. So my point being is we lose the game. Halftime 10 to three. We end up losing 24 to 10. Um, you've never, let me just say this. If you've never had 100,000 people boo you, you've missed out in life. That was the first time. You know, the cheering was great, but it was like, it really didn't sink into me until they booed us. And I just remember thinking like, holy cow, this is what 100,000 people sounds like booing you. And it was, you know, it was one of those things where it was just like, okay, this isn't, I'm not at North High anymore. I'm not at Coffeeville Community College anymore. This is like, this is the real deal. Like they're, they're booing us. And so it was, I mean, you know, I, I, that's a joke and it's funny. They, they did boo us. That sucks. But I think you just, it's like when you're a kid and you make the noise of, ah. I mean, at some point you just can't hear anything. You know, it's just, it's like a roar. It's like a, a jet engine or, or something like that. It just, it's an amazing feeling. It's an amazing sound. Um, it's really surreal for me because like I said, you know, three years before my first game, and I was done with football, didn't want to play anymore, was, you know, never going to play again. And now there's 100,000 people cheering every Saturday. And so it's, you know, again, it's one of those things where it's until you experience it, you know, I, I think when, when you come out of the tunnel at that place, you're on the turf, but it sure doesn't feel like it. It feels like you're floating. So, that kind of what it, that kind of what it sounds like? Pretty close? Yeah, exactly. Not even exactly. close. Not no, even close. It's an amazing, you know, I go back every, every couple of years. Um, we play uh, the school up north, and they have us back every two years. We make, it's called the Tunnel of Pride. It's a really cool tradition. And um, the team runs through 
on the field and we're on the field with them. And, you know, just to hear that again is like, it's that, it's that thing you chase the rest of your life. I've chased it in business. I've chased it personally. I've chased it. And you just, you never forget the first time you heard that noise and the first time they cheered for you. And um, yeah, it's an amazing, amazing thing. No question. That's cool. That's really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So, I mean, at OSU, 94, 95 is when you were there. You started all 26 games. Um, sounds like you had some nicks and some dings. I mean, that's got to, that just comes with football in general. But when you're playing at that level and you've got that many massive bodies and that many car wrecks happening <laughs> every play, I mean, right. you're going to get dinged up. But to start and, and start all 26 games in your career there, I mean, that's phenomenal. That's not many dudes can say that. No, but, and that, um, there, there was a lot of luck involved. I mean, I'll be honest with you, you know, it's, it's, I'm very proud of that streak. I'm very proud of that I was able, you know, especially coming in from junior college, Ohio State hadn't recruited a lot of junior college guys um, in a lot of years until I got there. Um, and so I was really proud of that. Um, I will tell you, there was some times where I'm still, you know, we laughed about it earlier, the, the whole 20 some years later, I'm not sure how I made it through the week to game day. I just was so beat up. I was so, you know, whether it was a shoulder, a groin, a turf toe, a, you know, an elbow, whatever. It's like, I mean, I just, I look back and I was like, man, I, you know, at one point in my life, I was pretty tough. You know, I, I, I did all right, but yeah, it was, it was an amazing, I also, you know, I looked at it as this, Tobin, I, I had two years, games, you know, and that was, I was fortunate to have 26 games. We, we played in two, two uh, kickoff games. Uh, to start each season, we played in a pigskin classic and a kickoff classic, and then we played in a bowl game both years. So, I actually, got four additional games that I, you know, that most kids aren't guaranteed, and and I just I didn't want to let any of those opportunities go by. To me, it was a it was an opportunity to go out and play the game that I love, and and I spent two years in Coffeeville, you know, trying to get to this point. So if I could, if they could wheel me out there and and bandage me up and get me ready to go, that's that's what I was going to do. And um, again, I don't know. At, at 48 years old, I don't know how I was that tough at 20 because I'm surely not that tough now. But when it counted, I was there. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm very proud of that. The bodies don't they don't bounce back as quickly now when we get up into those 40s and near 50, do they? No, no, I can't. You, I mean, you hurt you know, in places you didn't know you had. You don't know how you did it. No, exactly. I I've told this story before when I've talked to high school kids and and when I went back and spoke to junior college kids, it's like, you know, I can remember in high school we would play. I never came off the field. I played offense. I played defense, special teams. I kicked. I did all kinds of stuff. And then Saturday mornings, I'd get up and we'd go to the YMCA and play basketball out on West Central. I mean, we'd, you know, we'd go beat a bunch of guys and go play basketball for two, three hours. And then I got to junior college and I'd get up on Sunday mornings and I was like, man, I, you know, God, leave my body hurts. Then I got to Ohio State and on Sunday mornings, it was like I had to check to make sure, you know, I still had every body part, but everything was still attached. And, you know, it just, it was a different, like you said, to your point, it's, it's car wrecks. It's 65, 70 car wrecks a game. And, and the average person, you know, it doesn't, the other thing is, I think, you know, even nowadays with all the TV angles and all the different TV coverage, people still don't understand how fast and how physical the game is. And that was 20 years. I mean, you know, 25 years ago, 26 years ago, like the game has, has gotten even, you know, just watched last night in Alabama and Georgia, that was two fast teams on the field. And so, yeah, it's, it's changed, but I'm definitely proud of that. I'm definitely, um, it was a miracle. There was some, there was some things that happened along the way that where it was just like, okay, I'm, I'm probably going to miss this game and then I would be ready for the game. And so I'm proud of that. I really am. I, I you know, it's one of the things, like I said, I, it, it also translates obviously as you get older, you know, there's been plenty of times in the last 20 years in the workforce that I didn't feel like going to work, but you got to get up and go to work. So kind of one of those things where it, it's, the transferable skill is something I've taken with me from the game and, and um, yeah, good experience for sure. And, and something you said earlier resonates with me. It's that, it's that feeling that you chase always once you've had that oh, last, yeah. that last opportunity. I mean, I can, you know, my last football game was in high school. Yeah. I can remember it vividly. I could probably almost give you a play by play of the darn thing. And okay. I think everybody that's played football has that, that moment. And, you know, it's like in all sports. I mean, you, you get, you, you don't realize when you're playing it how blessed you are to be able to play a kid's game um, and, and get to do it to whatever level you get to. But eventually everybody's told basically that you can no longer play this game. And yeah. um, 
then you spend the rest of your life wanting to get back to that feeling and you know being out there especially in football with the team support getting out there with your brothers and just in the grind and you know in the dirt and the sweat and just going and uh that, that's Brother. something you said that'll stick with me there is always chasing that well and i've you know this is one of the things that, that I, I also tell you know kids when i go to our teams and i go talk to them is like you know football special because you get like to your point you you know nobody gets away even the great ones they get told that they're no longer wanted or they need to retire or whatever and the one thing about football is you know you if you play baseball and it's no disrespect to baseball but if you play baseball you can go play slow pitch softball in a men's league and drink some beer and you kind of have the you know it's not the same obviously but you're still kind of doing the same thing you're hitting the ball you're throwing a ball you're catching the ball you're kind of still in that environment you know football when it's over it's over you don't I'm not going to call you this Sunday and say, hey, Tobin, let's grab our pads and go down to the park and you know, do some one-on-ones and run into each other 60 times. Like, that just doesn't happen, right? So that's the other thing that I think, I, obviously, everybody feels special about their sport, but that's one thing that I hold on to with football. It's like, it's such a, you know, such a finite time in the game, and then it's over, and it's truly over. I mean, yeah, you can go play, they have some seven-on-seven -seven leagues and some things like that, right? But there's no feeling like buckling your helmet up, going out and running into somebody 70 times a game. And, and then, you know, the aftermath, I mean, like I said, I still remember, you know, vividly, like it was yesterday. I still remember getting on the bus, my last game at, at Coffeyville at Wichita North at Ohio state, those times. I mean, you just never forget those times. And so, yeah, I think it, it definitely, I, like I said, I'm still chasing it. I'm, it's been away from the game for about 23 years as far as playing. Um, I've coached and done some things like that, but it's still a feeling that I know I'll chase the rest of my life because it's just, it's such an amazing feeling. Awesome. So I, I have to admit, I was totally in awe as I was sitting down doing some research for this and was looking through those rosters of the 94, 95 squads. I mean, it, it's literally a who's who of dudes. I mean, it is unreal when I was going through those rosters and I was scrolling through them and I just, I get out into the bottom and I'm like, wait, Luke Fickle, Luke Fickle was on that team. <laughs> Yeah. I, I knew variable, but right. I mean, just, just let me rattle some of these off here and then I'll have you kind of give me a thought on each one here after, I mean, for those of you that aren't aware and don't know the 94, 95 rosters at the Ohio state university, I mean, everybody remembers the dude that won the Heisman, Eddie George. Um, everybody remembers the dude that was like a semi truck to Jamie's left Orlando pace. Who's in the hall of fame. Um, the speed, you had Joey Galloway, you got Ricky Dudley at tight end. Uh, you got Mike Vrabel, who's, you know, coaching the number one team in, in the AFC playoffs right now. Um, you got Sean Springs, Luke Fickle, who coached a lot of people might not recognize that name yet, but don't sleep on him. You know, head coach at University of Cincinnati that just, just played in the semifinals is, I think, the first group of five mm -hmm. uh, school to make that. So, I mean, yes, they were. that's freaking cool. Um you know, you have um, the late Corey Stringer um, and Terry Glenn as well. I mean, and when I was going through that, and I probably missed some dudes too, but um, when I look at that, I'm like, wow. And then there's Jamie Sumner, Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> right. I mean, dude, that's that. People don't realize how cool that is and what that's like to be. Those are your brothers, dude. No, no question. I mean, you know, they're, we call it the brotherhood, obviously, at Ohio State. Um, it's a, it's a, again, and I, you know, you grew up in the same time period I did. So we grew up with, with KU and K state, you know, being two and 10, one and 11, Oh, and 12. Like that was the football we grew up with. And to go into a program like Ohio state is obviously, I mean, that's just, like I said before, that's a dream come true. But then we start talking about the people and the guys I played with, you know, I can, I can tell you the guys you, that you named off, you know, the successes that they've had. The Luke, Luke, so let's just start with Luke. Luke Fickle um, was one of the toughest defensive linemen um, that I ever played against, you know, practiced against. Um, I'm not surprised that he has Cincinnati in the position he does. He's 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 a legitimate tough guy. He was a great high school wrestler, uh, amazing work ethic. Our, our lockers actually faced each other um, at Ohio State. So I'm not surprised with his success. I mean, you know, um, he played his last game with a torn pack. In, in college. I mean, you know, so that's what you're talking about. Mike Vrabel, probably one of the smartest football players um, I've ever been around, hardest workers. I mean, just go through that list. Terry Glenn, Joey Galloway, and you know, all those guys, they were they were all special. You know, Corey, 
Corey's always been special to me um, just because he was so welcoming when I got there. Um, but, you know, Ricky Dudley's a guy that he played basketball. Basketball and then decided I, he played high, he played high school football in Texas. Um, so he was familiar, obviously, with football. But you know, Ricky Dudley's a guy who plays four years of basketball. Hey, I'm going to go out for football. Ends up being the number seven or number eight overall pick in, in the NFL draft. So, you know, played with, and Rick's a great guy. I mean, there, there's just a, I think that's the thing that is as talented as all those guys were um, on the football field, amazing people off of it, hard workers. Um, they're all having an impact, you know, with what they've cho- with the routes they've chosen to go. But yeah, I definitely played with some amazing people, man. And, and um, you know, Eddie obviously is special. The Heisman Trophy, I mean, blocking for Heisman Trophy winner is a very special club. Um, a very unique, it's a very unique club of people that that are a part of that. Um, again, I go back to the same thing I told you earlier you know, to, to sit and think that, you know, I sat on the back of a bus and told myself I wasn't going to play again. To four years later, I'm playing with a Heisman Trophy winner. Um, that's an amazing. It's over. You know, there's times, Tobin, where, to be honest with you, um, it's like you have to. I have to pinch myself. Did that really ha- Like, did, did I really get to experience that? Did I really get to do that? Um, so, you know, there, the last 26 years of my life, however many weeks that is, but you know, whatever the number is, there's not been one week that's went by in 26 years where the Heisman Trophy hasn't affected my life in some way. Whether it's somebody bringing it up, somebody asking me about it, it's provided an opportunity for me. It's you know, got my foot in the door. There's, I mean, it's just, it's amazing how much that, that award, and it's Eddie's award, no question, but it's like one of those things where it's like, because I was a small piece of it, it's opened so many doors. And that just, it blows me away. I mean, it blows me away that, that 25, 26 years later, it still affects my life and still gives me opportunities and still allows me to do things. that just, it's crazy to me. And then obviously Orlando, um, you know, playing in, Playing next to him was like, I mean, it was just like watching a machine every week. I mean, just le- legitimately the best pure football player I've ever, most dominant, most pure. I mean, if, <clears throat> there's always been my argument about the Heisman Trophy is they say it's for the best football player in college football, right? If that's the case, then Orlando Pace should have w- at least won one of them. I mean, he just showed wow. he was the most dominant uh, week in, week out, dominant players that I've ever seen. Um, humble, quiet. Um, you know, and then when he got, so then he got inducted um, into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He invited us as his guests to come, um, and that was an emotional experience. I mean, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be lying to say anything else. I mean, I, we were at the, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and it was just tears running down my face because I'm like, man, how did I? I'm like you said, from the north end of Wichita. You know, I, I'm, I'm thankful for all my experiences. I'm thankful for everything that, that 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 created and provided, but. To be standing at the Pro Football Hall of Fame with one of my teammates as his guest and to see him get put in, it was emotional. It was like I said, I'm standing there with tears in my eyes and running down my face. And I'm just like, how did how did I end up here, getting to be a part? Again, it's like the Heisman Trophy. How did I get to be a part of this? Um, just amazing. I mean, just like I said, there's so many times where I'm just like, did that really happen? Did that really was I really a part of that? Because it just it, it's just so improbable and it's so I don't know. It just, it, it just, it's been an amazing ride as far as that stuff goes. It really has been. Yeah. Well, and Jamie, for our listeners and our viewers, um, when you were playing, how, how tall, how tall were you? And what did you weigh in at, at that point? So I left high school. I was six, four, I was about six, four, six, four and a quarter, about two fifty, two forty five, two fifty. pretty much played my freshman year at that weight at Coffeyville. Um, my sophomore year at Coffeyville, I was two, 280, 285. Um, and I just, I mean, you know, that, that's another thing. I mean, you talk about that. To gain that much weight, if you would if you would see, like, the problem is I still eat today like I ate back then to gain the weight, and I don't work out anymore. But, I mean, I was stuffing myself six, seven times a day. I mean, I, I was going, you know, through the cafeteria line at the beginning when it would open, at the end <laughs> before it would close. I mean, I just, I was sleeping. I was working out. And just one of those things where it's like, you know, so many things, that's why I say, when I said earlier, so many things had to fall into place for that to happen, you know, gaining that much weight. Um, when I got to Ohio State, I got up, I usually played around 295, 300. Um, and yeah, it, it, so yeah, it's one of those things where, like I said, I, I, I wish I still, 
I wish I, I wish I could forget how to eat like that, <laughs> but I don't. So, but no, it was, yeah, it, it, one of those things where, you know, I was always a pretty decent athlete. Uh, I played basketball four years in high school, uh, ran track. So, you know, I was, I mean, I was a pretty athletic guy. Um, I just didn't figure, like I said earlier, I, my biggest, I don't want to say a regret, but if I could, you know, if, if there's something I could go back and change, it was, I thought I was working hard when I was in high school, but I wasn't. And I didn't, I just didn't, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so that's the thing that's probably, it's not frustrating, but it's like, you know, I challenge my son with it. You know, he's, he's a freshman in high school and he plays football. And it's like, I try to give him some of those lessons, like, man, you know, don't be like me. I was, you know, I didn't figure out how to work and how to focus on my craft and how to focus on what I needed to improve on until I got older, you know, try You need to figure it out now and, and take some of this advice. So, yeah, I was, I mean, like I said, I was, I was pretty fortunate. I, I, uh, I had some tools and some gifts, you know, from a, from a, um, you know, mentally, from a mental aspect, I never made very many, you know, assignment errors or those kinds of things. That was, that was probably what kept me on the field as much as anything was that I played hard. I didn't make mistakes and it was important to me. But once I got to college, the game of football was important to me. It truly was. And so I turned it into something. Yeah. And, you know, so you went from 6'4", 250 to 6'4", 295, pushing 300. And for our YouTube viewers, I'll see if I can snag one of these pictures. But there's a couple pictures out there of, you know, Jamie standing right next to Orlando. And Jamie's a big dude. I, I mean, you're a big dude. But you look like somebody's little brother standing next to Orlando. People don't realize how massive and just, I mean, he is just a mountain. So we went and that to, can move. Oh, no, that can he, move. Nah. No, you, there's no, yeah. The, the, I, like I just said, I was a decent athlete. Orlando Pace at his size was a phenomenal athlete. I mean, just 6'7, 330, 340, and dunk a basketball with ease, can run the court, can pull, can pass block. I mean, just an amazing athlete. But yeah, it's funny because when we went to the, I hadn't seen Orlando in a long, I mean, it had been years and years and years. We go to the, the Hall of Fame ceremony, and somebody saw me hug Orlando. And they were like, you know, I've never seen anybody make you look small. <laughs> I started wow. laughing. I said, like, yeah, it's a good feel. Like, I always like hanging out with him. And then, you know, another good, a really, another really good friend of mine is a guy named John Lumpkin. And John, John played tight end at Ohio State. Um, we came in the same class together. But he, uh, he's 6'9", probably I don't know. He was probably 260, 265 when we played. He's a little bit heavier than that now, but he's another one. When people see me next to him, they're like, man, I've never seen anybody that much taller than you. And I'm like, yeah, I, I like these guys. They make me feel small. They make me feel, you know, make me feel like I'm like I'm in shape again. So, yeah. Well, sure. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to have been a, a, a cornerback or a safety seeing you or Orlando spring, spring free to that second level for a block out in front of somebody because, I mean, that's just like a couple semis coming down I-70 right there. Yeah, we, you know, we, I played with guys, our, our whole group, both years I was there. Um, I mean, it's five of the most athletic big men I've ever been around in my life. I mean, just from, from, from left to right. I mean, from Orlando to Corey to Juan Porter, who was our center. And he was an amazing athlete. Uh, LaShawn Daniels is another one that, you know, we had, like I said, we had Ricky Dudley, who was a two sport athlete in college. I mean, we had some guys and we had some, like I said, it's pretty humbling. You know, when you grow up thinking you're a pretty good athlete, and you get around guys like this, and it's like, you know what? I'm really not that athletic compared to these guys. So, um, yeah, it was it was a good it was a good humbling for sure. So, so is there one game in particular that sticks out in your mind in that that time at Ohio State? Yeah, there's. You know what? I'll, I will tell you this. Obviously, you're measured up there by winning the game against um, Michigan, and I'll say that. Oh my right God, now. he said it. Hold on, I wait, said, wait. Well, yeah, no, be. <laughs> Yeah, beep that out. I, I wanted to explain it, though. So, it's you know, University of Michigan, we call it the school up north or the team up north. Um, when I got there, Coach Cooper hadn't won that game yet. And so, my first year there, we beat them. Um, like I said, that was a game I grew up watching on TV. And so, it was one of those things where that's the, that's the main one for me because it, it gave me a pair of gold pants, um, which is a big, a big deal at Ohio State. Um, if you've ever heard the phrase, you know, we all grew up in a time where your, your, your parents or somebody, your coaches, somebody said, Hey, they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like we do. 
that phrase came from an Ohio State football coach back in the 30s. And so when you win the game, you're given this little charm. Uh, it's a pair of gold football pants. It's a big deal uh, to be a part of that club at Ohio State. And so that obviously is the biggest one. I would say that the right behind that is we beat Notre Dame uh, my senior year, and we hadn't played them in 60 years. So that was a huge, um, a huge, you know, victory. Um, those, are, but those would for sure be the top two for me, um, just because of the magnitude of it. Because, like I said, it was, you know, it, it's it was all it encompassed all the things from when I was a kid. You know, the, the, we played the team up north. I remember war, in warm ups, I looked up. And a good year blimp was there. It was just like, man, I'm, you know, I made it. It's another thing, right? Yeah, like, well, but it's one of those things where it's like, you know, like, like the good year blimp is here. Like, that's crazy. And then I, the other thing for me, that, and you'll get a kick out of this because because you remember this from from your days playing. The you know, Northwest used to be the, and they're they're obviously good again in high school football in Wichita. But back then they were, you know, they were dominant. And so to look across the field and see those helmets and see that jersey, to me, it yeah. was like. And, and the fight song, play. even even yeah. the fight song, they still even the fight song. Okay, yeah. that's and I didn't realize that part. It's just one of those things where it's like you know, like for me, that that made that game just so much special. I never beat Northwest in high school in football, but to beat Michigan kind of felt like the monkey was off my back a little bit, um, and I could enjoy it. But yeah, those two games for sure were just like I said, because of the magnitude of them, because of what it stood for, because of who those schools are, because of who we are. It just was special for sure. Those are the those are the two without question. Yeah, I mean, those are two of the storied programs in college football history. I mean, you know, we grew up when we were little. That that Ohio State, I'll say it, Michigan, Michigan game was always a big one. You know, it yeah. was always huge. It was you know, it was the game that Keith Jackson would call, and I mean, you know, it was it was one of those. And Notre Dame was the same way. I mean, every Saturday they were on TV. No question. And growing up as a kid, that's who you saw and. So that, I can see why those are two two that really stand out to you. Um, so let's take this a little bit different direction here. Um, you know, I know you you mentioned that your son is a, a freshman in high school and playing. Um, you know, I've got a daughter that went through and played um, collegiate volleyball. Um, as somebody who's gotten to those high levels, what advice would you give kids and their parents these days who think they want to play big time college football? Well, how much time do we have? Um, you know, I, as much as you need, big boy. <laughs> I, you know, here's the thing. And I, I'm I'm kidding, but I, I think the thing that same thing I would tell parents is this: is number one, be a cheerleader. Be be your child's biggest supporter. That doesn't mean getting on social media and bashing coaches or doing those kinds of things. It means supporting your kid and whatever they choose to do. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would tell you that watch what you wish for because. <laughs> Playing big time college football, it, you know, it, it's fun. Don't get me wrong; it's a blast. It's also a business now more than ever. And so, you know, my challenge to anybody that wants to do it is, and this has been my challenge to my own son, is, you know, we, we live in a world where there's a ton of information available, you know, YouTube, uh, just the internet in general. But like, for instance, YouTube. My son's an offensive lineman. Hey, I know you like the game, but what are you doing to better yourself football wise? Are you getting on YouTube? Are you on Twitter? Are you finding other outlets for information, those kinds of things. I think that's the part is, you know, understand the process. The process is, you know, it's not, I tell kids this all the time. It's, it's not, and I tell parents this as well, <clears throat> excuse me. It's not, it's a game on Saturday. For three hours on Saturday, it is a game. Enjoy that three hours on Saturday. The rest of the week, it's a business. It's Jamie Sumner Incorporated. It's Tobin Acevedo Incorporated. It's John Doe Incorporated. You need to treat it as such. Um, you know, it's just, there's a lot to it. Um, there's a lot of dirty, you know, it, it's not as clean and as polished as, and fun as what you see on Saturday afternoons. You know, there's a lot of dirty, there's a dirty undercurrent in it. Um, the NIL, excuse me, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in it now. When there's money, there's obviously, that brings out, you know, that brings out some bad sometimes. You know, just... That would be the first, you know, and that sounds really negative, and I don't mean for it to sound negative, but I just think that sometimes parents, kids, et cetera, they think that, well, I signed my scholarship papers, I've made it. No, it just started. You know, you sign those, you sign those scholarship papers off what you did in high school. When you show up to, to, 
Ohio State or KU or K State or OU or wherever you go, the clock started over. You know, your your career is is just starting. And so I think that's the, you know, that's the lesson to learn as well is, you know, you're the hottest thing in the world today. They're recruiting your replacement tomorrow. And they're recruiting your replacement the day after and the day after. And the day like it just never stops. And so I think, you know, there's you know, there's obviously a ton of positive. The exposure, the network you build, the opportunities that you get. Again, you're talking to a kid from the north end of Wichita that I got to go all over the country, got to experience some of the neatest things in the world. Um, we got to stand on top of the World Trade Center, the original World Trade Center, um, because we played in a game in New York. Got to go to the New York Stock Exchange. I got to do, I mean, there's so many things that it provided. So I don't want to sound completely negative, but just understand that there's a ton of work that goes into getting those opportunities. And, and it's just, um, you know, I think that's the biggest thing. Parents just think they have a pie in the sky, you know, vision of what they want for little Johnny. And that's awesome. But just understand that little Johnny is going to have a ton of work and it's not always going to be fair. And things are going to be asked of him that haven't been asked before and those kinds of things. And so I just think it's one of those things where just, you know, not to be naive, talk to people who have been there, talk to people who have done it, those kinds of things. But um, at the end of the day, Remember that it's a business and remember that you're responsible for your own business and take and yeah. take advantage of it. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, that's probably the thing I'm, you know, one of the other things I'm most proud of is I can go back to Columbus, Ohio and get a job because I never embarrassed the school. I always took care of my business. I graduated, you know, I wasn't an academic problem. I wasn't a problem in the community, those kinds of things. I mean, just remember you, you know, you have one name and, and they're going to put it on the front page if you mess up and they're going to put it on the back page when you, when you get cleared. So it's kind of one of those things as well. Is just remember you're a business now. And, um, you know, and it's going to sound funny to say it this way, but, you know, have fun with it. You're going to have fun, right? But you, there's time to work and there's time to play, just like anything. So um, that, that would be my advice. I mean, that's, that's a bunch of different things. But that, in a nutshell, that's probably the best things I can say. No, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I know you mentioned, you know, when you were in high school, you were a three-sport athlete. Um, this day and age, um, you know, I know you were three sport letterman. Um, what do you think about all these players who are wanting to specialize in a sport super young in their careers these days? What are your thoughts you know, on that? I don't, I get it on one hand, you know, if, if football's what you love or baseball or basketball or whatever, I mean, I understand. I think it's good to broaden your horizons. You know, I, I personally, when I coach, you know, I, I spent a couple of years coaching at Coffeyville. When I would go watch high school kids, I wanted to watch them compete in another arena. You know, I love, I used to love going to basketball games. You know, I've seen the kid on the football field. He's not afraid to commit, you know, commit and compete on a football field, but what does he do in the fourth quarter down by three and he's on the foul line? You know, does he welcome that opportunity? Does he shy away from it? Does he play hard? How is he with his teammates? Those kinds of things. So I think there's some things you can gather from it. I think the narrative that, you know, you have to run track to be a good football player. I don't agree with that. Or you have to play basketball to be a good football player. Or you have to wrestle to be a good. Like, I don't I don't buy into that either. I think, you, you know, if it's something you want to do and it's something you love to do, then go do it for sure. And you got plenty of time to specialize when you get to, when you get to college. Um, but, the, you know, to do it at 9, 10, 11 years old, that's, I think that's ridiculous. And the other thing is this, and you know this as well as I do, kids' bodies change mentalities change, um, you know, play, play as much as you can for as long as you can, as long as you want to. My son, you know, as an example, uh, my son's played lacrosse for uh, four years, five years. He decided he didn't want to play this year. Focus on football. Okay, that's fine. Let's, you know, if you let's figure out something else for you to try in the meantime. But I'm not, a, you know, I'm not going to force him to go do something he doesn't want to do or that, that, you know, I just don't subscribe to that either is you don't have to do you don't have to do another sport to be successful in your chosen sport. Right. Right. So, so you did mention, you know, you spent a couple of years um, coaching at Coffeeville and, and we're out on the recruiting trail. Maybe, maybe talk about some of the other things that are out there in this world today that has changed as far as the recruiting goes and things that maybe parents and student athletes maybe need to, to consider, you know, when you start talking the realm of social media and some of these things that, and, you know, talk about how that impacts it from the view uh, of a college coach that's out there looking and recruiting and evaluating, you know, 
all these kids and they're all good athletes. They're all the best athletes at their school. But talk a little bit about how some of that can be used to kind of maybe delineate and sort them out. Sure. So, I mean, obviously, social media has has created opportunities for everybody. I mean, I, you know, I'm a I'm a firm believer, and this isn't popular with everybody, but if you want to play college, if you play high school football and you want to play college football, there's somewhere for you. There is. There's somewhere. It may not be Notre Dame. It may not be Ohio State. It may not be K State. But you can go play somewhere. There's a place for you somewhere. And so social media has opened those doors. You know, it's 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 even the playing field. It's it's made it so a coach in, you know, some, you know, middle of Tennessee can see a kid in Wichita, Kansas. And he doesn't have to travel here. He doesn't have to get a videotape. He doesn't have to do. You know, you can post. It's a not link. like it was when we were, you know, no, in the early no, '90s, where it was you no. get a stack of letters and maybe right. send out some VHS tapes. No, not and and here's the thing. And real quick, just to go back on this, I'm thankful for VHS tapes. That's how I got recruited to Ohio State. They were recruiting another player at another school, and that kid didn't play very good. And so they fast-forwarded the, the VHS tape, and they saw me. I just happened to have – it was the best game I had in college, period. It just worked out. But, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not like that anymore. There's, you, know, you can create a huddle link and post it on your social media, and it's visible to everybody on Twitter just like that. There's no sending out tapes. There's not stuff. So I think – Social media is even the playing field. Now, with that said, you know, just like we just talked about, what are you doing with your social media? You're, if your idea or your want or your you know, goal is to get a college scholarship, then what you put on social media needs to be driven towards obtaining that goal. So when you put a huddle, you know, it's called a like a huddle is a film system that you can, you know, you can make a highlight tape, you can post a link, that kind of stuff. What are your grades? What's your class rank? height, size, weight, speed, you know, lifts, any honors that you've received, those kinds of things, that should all be on there to sell you. You know, that those are the things that you need to put out into the into the social media world so that people go, and you know what, we're looking for a kid about like this. Let's well, you know, let's watch his film. You know, what does your film look like? Does you know make sure that that what you're trying to convey, type of player you are, is conveyed in the film and the clips that you provide. You know, if 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 I'm an offensive lineman, it better be, you know, 10 or 10, 10, 12, 15 clips of just being nasty, you know, finishing plays, playing through the whistle, being physical, um, you know, hitting, not being, a, you know, not being afraid to hit guys, those kinds of things. And that's what I'm looking for. You know, a prime example is um, when Ben Powers, if you're familiar with him, you know, from Cape, plays for the Ravens, played at Butler, played at OU, and then is with the, the Baltimore Ravens now. I was in his film when he was a sophomore in high school. Somebody sent me a huddle link. Um, of Ben and said, Hey, what do you think of this kid? And I was like, that kid, is, that kid is going to be a big time player. I saw that because, and he was raw at the time, but he played so hard. He was so physical. He wasn't standing around. I mean, it was just things that you could look at and go, and that kid's got the right temperament, the right attitude, the right work ethic, those kinds of things. So, you know, there's, the thing is everybody's eyes different. What I see in a kid and what I think is impressive, somebody else may not be impressed by. You know, I feel like I, you know, technique wise and those kinds of things, you can teach kids that, but you can't teach desire. You can't teach heart. You can't teach, you know, some of the want to side of it. You can't, that side you can't teach. And so, you know, again, everything needs to be geared towards selling yourself. You know, like I said, keep your parents off social media. You know, parents, parents and parents probably are the result, probably are the reason or that you don't get the results they want more often than not because they've posted something, they've bashed a coach, they've, you know, they've done something, they've questioned something. Coaches don't want to deal with that crap. You know, they just don't. I mean, I, they don't want to deal with, I didn't want to deal with it. I mean, that was one of the first questions when I would talk to high school coaches. Hey, tell me about Tobin. You know, what's Tobin's family like? Are there any problems there? You know, um, that's, I mean, parents need to understand that piece of it as well as just be, like I said earlier, just be a cheerleader. Support your kid, be there for him. You know, but at the end of the day, don't do anything to harm their process or, or take, you know, draw anything negative to it because coaches do pay attention to that stuff. You know, whether it's yeah, two I... years, two years or four years, look, we don't want to deal with a headache for two years. You know, we don't want to mm -hmm. deal with a headache for four years. We want to deal with supportive parents, you know. And, you know, the other thing is, too, is, is as a coach, when you go in, you're responsible for building that relationship. You know, hey, I'm telling you I'm going to take care of your kid, so I'm going to take care of your kid. 
And that's what you have to live up to. So it's a two-way street, but I think a lot of times parents don't realize just how much they can hinder their child's opportunities by being, you know, a loud mouth or being, you know, a person that, that like I said, lashes out on social media or those kinds of things. So, um, but social media, if, if done right and, and the right things, you know, the right things in mind, it can, it can create a heck of a lot of opportunities for you. There's no question. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it can go the other way too. I mean, I know you want to be cautious as the kid, you know, what are you posting on your social media? You got to remember people are seeing this and it's out there forever. You think you delete it? Yeah, somebody's got yeah. it. So, you know, be cognizant and, and responsible with that. And I mean, you know, I know I've talked to a lot of coaches and, you know, you just nailed it on the head. I mean, the tape, the tape is the tape. And if they see something they like, their next question is what kind of kid is he? What kind of student is he? What's the parents like? Is he a problem? And that yeah. social media can become a problem sometimes too, I think. Well, but, I think um, it needs to be, you know, this is gonna, it's kind of like, it needs to, your social media, if you're trying to get a scholarship and use your social media for that, it needs to be as bland as possible. I mean, it just does. You know, my, my son, he's a freshman and, and he has no social media. I haven't told him not to have it. He just, he's not interested. Now, if the time comes where he needs to start selling himself and doing those things, in the back of my mind, I'm already happy because it's like, well, at least he doesn't have anything on there that he shouldn't. There's nothing to clean up. It's it's a very it's going to be a very vanilla start from scratch, you know, kind of operation. And that's the other thing is just to your point, you know, what you put out there is, you know, what you put out there is, is what you put out there. But at the same time, understand that what you may not find offensive, somebody else may find offensive. Yeah. You know, um, the flyover states in the Midwest. So we're going to, we're going to look at certain posts and certain things a lot different than what they are on the coast. This is just how it is down South is going to view what we view different. I mean, there's just, so it's just one of those things where that would be the other advice is just, you know, very bland, very, here's my huddle. Here's my highlight tape. You know, here's my coach's contact info, et cetera, and keep it very plain. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. So one more question here off script. Um, you know, I know you've got a, you know, a successful business career that you've been in now that we, you know, we have to get a, grow up and get a real job and all that stuff. What, what are some of the things that you feel like sports has really given you and trans, helped you in that transition into your professional life and your professional career um, that you kind of have carried through? And, um, you know, what advice do you have for people in that world as to what sports can bring to that? Well, so obviously, you know, in sports, and you know this, you know, goal setting is a, is a huge part of being a successful athlete. You know, hey, I shot 50% from the field this year. I want to shoot 55% next year. So what do I need to do? Well, I've got to go to work. I've got to get more shots up in the off season. I've got to have a focus, you know, focus plan to get that done. So you know, goal setting would be the first one. You know, um, not sit, you know, goal setting. You're not sitting still if you're setting goals. If you're setting the right goals. You're not sitting still. You're not resting on what you've already done. I think that's one thing. Um, you know, and that goes both ways. That's that's as an employee, and that's also from an employer standpoint. Hiring, athletes. you know, your athletes are used to being the goal setters. They're used to you know chasing. They know how to work. They know how to you know perform under pressure. You know, like we joked about it earlier, but the whole thing about you know 100,000 people booing you. I, you know, I, I've had some I've had some flubs in the business world and had some things that were bad, but nothing compares to that pressure. You know, there was 100,000 experts every Saturday. And another, you know, God knows how many million people on TV watching. So, I mean, there's one of those things where, you know, being able to perform under pressure. You know, I, I moved up pretty quick in the transportation business when I first got into it because I was willing to do things that other people weren't. Well, that came from you know, practicing in 100 degree heat, you know, 60 car wrecks a game, as you said earlier. Like some of those things from a mental toughness standpoint and a and an ability to 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 focus in and do what needed to be done there was people who weren't willing to do those things. And so again, that, that goes back to what I said just a minute ago. I mean, if you're an employer and you're looking for employees, that's what you should look to. Um, you know, I, another thing probably would be um, time management, you know, organizational skills and time management. I mean, you know, you talked about what do parents need to know? What do kids need to know? You know, your time is, is your time is taken up and there's a lot of long nights and early mornings whether it's getting up for workouts, it's going to study hall, it's going back after practice to study hall, it's going to meet in a study group, it's, you know, you've got practice, you've got to get treatment. I mean, there's, you're juggling a bunch of balls 
that all have to get done and all have to, you know, are all important, but what's the priority? You know, so there's some things like that. Like I said, time management, being organized, those things. Um, those are probably the four, three or four probably best ones or biggest ones. Um, and those are the ones that have, have always been good for me. The other thing is, you know, I think football is unique um, in this aspect. And it's not, I shouldn't say it's unique. Uh, every sport has it. Football is probably more just because of the sheer size. You're going to be around guys you don't like in the football locker room. There's going to be guys you don't care for, guys you don't see eye to eye with. You have different politics. You have different religions. You have different whatever. But when we go on the field, we have to go be successful for Ohio State. To put all that stuff aside, we have to go work for a common goal. And that sounds corny and that sounds cliche. But I think that's the other thing you learn in athletics is, you know, how to communicate under pressure, how to work towards a common goal, how to put BS aside and focus on, you know, what the important things are. And, there, you know, there's no feeling in the world like um, making a two-minute drive in front of 90,000 people to win a game. That's an awesome feeling. Well, it's no different than getting a project done in the 11th hour because you and six people that you work with were able to come together and hash it out and each had a different piece and you all put it together and, you know, you got the grant or you got the, you know, they change your budget or whatever the case may be. Those things are important. Those things are huge. And, and it, again, not to be, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to, to other people. There's a lot of people from that don't come from a, you know, I think you know, obviously military people have those same qualities. Um, athletes have those same qualities. Um, but that's the, you know, those are the things that are going to, that are going to carry and make you successful um, long-term for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, teamwork is, is huge and not everybody understands and can work in that team environment. They all want to have the spotlight. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, when you get everybody pulling that rope the same direction, it's amazing the things that can be done, whether it's at North High or Coffeeville or Ohio State University um, yeah. or in the transportation world. Yeah. So, yeah, it all carries over and carries through. So, um, uh, so I did ask you, so with three dogs and a dude, obviously my three dogs are all rescues and, and they, um, you know, kind of inspired me with their loyalty and just their love and just um, it's just unconditional. And, uh, you know, they're living their best lives. And so I always like to ask my guests uh, to tell me a little bit about uh, their pet, if they might have one, if you have a dog in particular. And uh, when, when we were talking pre-production, you mentioned that your dog's name was Scarlet. And I thought, well, how, how ripe is that? A dude from the Ohio State University names his dog Scarlet. But, yeah. but you tell me that Scarlet was named Scarlet before it even came to you. Yeah, so we actually rescued her from a lady that my fiance works with. and. Um, I'll just say that this lady doesn't have real good luck with animals. And so we had lost, um, we had lost a boxer and it was, it was one of those, um, just, it was, yeah, it was heartbreaking. So we'd went probably, I don't know, four or five months, maybe without, excuse me, without a dog. And, and so, uh, Casey came home and said, Hey, you know, uh, this lady, I won't say her name, has a dog. And I said, well, what kind of dog is it? Well, it's a boxer. She showed me a picture and I was just like, oh my gosh. And so Casey was still kind of like, I don't know. You know, I just, I'm not, I'm not sure if we're ready. I said, well, just go see the dog. I said, that dog is beautiful. Well, I never had, I, first boxer we had was the first boxer I'd ever had. I didn't, I mean, those dogs, their personalities are amazing. I mean, an awesome personality. So you go see the, our new, you know, the dog we have now. And so what was funny was, is she, Sends me the picture. She goes and sees it. She goes, well, what do you think? And I said, we got to get this dog. She goes, well, let me tell you the name. And I go, okay, what's the name? Scarlet. And I was like, that's her name? And she's like, yeah, that's her name already. And I was like, well, that's, we got to do this. Like, there's no question. So anyway, so she, yeah, we, uh, we ended up taking her and taking her on. We've had her for, let's see, it goes by so fast, five years now? Yeah, five years. So she was about a year old when we got her. So she's, and she's something else. I mean, if you, you've never been around boxers or you've never had a boxer, they are characters and they have a personality as, as big as the world. And so, yeah, I'll be a boxer. I'll be a boxer dad the rest of my life. And, um, yeah, she's, she's something else. She, she, we always laugh because Casey will ask me during the daytime, we'll text or whatever. She'll say, Scarlett, come to work today. Because she'll always poke her head in the office and come, you know, come needle me or come mess with me for a minute. 
I'm like, yeah, she came in for a little bit, you know. So, yeah, I, I love her to death. And like I said, I'll never, I will have boxers as, as often as I can. I will have a boxer for sure. That's an amazing story. It is tr- truly like it was meant to be, though. I mean. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's why I told her. I was like, you have got to go get that dog. Like any other dog um, would have been fine. We would have probably got any dog. But the fact that it was Scarlett was like, yeah, this is, this is a no-brainer. We need to do this. So, And then, like I said, her personality type, and you've, you've been around, um, you know, Casey, and, and you know how I am. So any dog that I'm going to have has to have a big personality. So. She fits right in and she rules the roost. I mean, that's that's what we always laugh about. It's like we'll take her, you know, through the drive through. We we'll go get some food or something. We'll she'll hop in and we'll take her. And, and people just, you know, like, oh my gosh, can I give your dog something? You know, they want to give her a treat. I'm like, we have the most spoiled boxer in the history of mankind. Like she is, like I said, she runs the house. We don't. She does. So I know the feeling. Yeah, I know the feeling. I have three of them that do that. So yeah, yeah. One, One's been enough for right now. Never know. You yeah, never you know. Don't. No, you yeah, don't. And the next one might be named Gray. I don't know. There you, that's a good, <laughs> good point. So to all my rescue connections out there, if you come across a dog that is named Gray and looking for a home, reach out to me. I can probably find a home with Scarlet there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's fantastic. So I would be amiss if I didn't uh, mention our our biggest comedian who's probably watching down on this podcast from the heavens right now, probably in his Notre Dame gear, laughing his butt off at both of us sitting here talking. Um, it's been just a little bit over a year since we lost my, my former brother-in-law, Sean McGinnis, and one of your best friends growing up. And, uh, yeah. you know, my question for you, I know, I know you and Sean go way back, but um, what are we going to do with his son and his affinity for that school up north? Yeah, that's a problem. Um, any, any school but that school would be fine. But, yeah, we're going to have to have some kind of, I don't know, intervention or or whatever. But, no, you know what? It's one of those things where it's you want, you want kids to have an opportunity. I, I've always laughed because I'm like, you know what? It'll be Maddox or it'll be my son, Ethan, or it'll be like the kids that I'm still really close with. It'll be one of those kids that'll get a scholarship up there and then I'm going to be in a I'm going to be in a heck of a pickle. You know, I'm going to be. Like it's gonna be one of those things where I'm gonna root for the kid, but I can't. You know, I've already I've already worked that through in the mirror. If if my son ever gets offered a scholarship, I'm gonna to have to have that. I'm rooting for you, but I'm not rooting for them. So old, when old that happens and the offer are, comes in, I want I want to go ahead and get in on it now that we can do that live on the air on the podcast. I want your reaction yeah. on tape. Uh, it'll be it, you'll 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 hear a lot of beeps probably because that. I'd be happy. I would, I would be happy, but it would be tough. It just, you know, old habits die hard. But yes, Sean is Sean is definitely looking down, laughing, um, and he's probably, you know, he's probably putting the word in that that uh, Maddox gets to go to Notre Dame instead of that school up north. I I'd hope so. Okay. I, I, I can okay approve that, that message. One. Yeah, yeah, I'd be okay with that. Yep, I can approve that message because if he goes up north, this is all we're going to hear out of Jamie. And then and Sean and, and Sean would be upstairs going. <laughs> oh, Sean would. Be, yeah, Sean would have a field day with it, um, just because he would know that it. it yeah, it got under my skin. He, he enjoyed nothing more than to get under my skin. So. Oh, definitely. So he's definitely one of a kind. I know we miss him terribly. Um, terribly. I see. I see him every time I look at Maddox, and I swear that kid grows an inch every time I see him. But. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that I think those two might be the only other people I know that may love football as much as you. So that's probably I mean, true. It's, it's it's kind of fun to to see that bond and that connection, and um, yeah. So I can't wait to uh, keep up and and see uh, your son's progress this year as uh, football season rolls back around. It's hard to believe that college is over, playoffs are here. Who's winning the Super Bowl? And now on the spot. I mean, you know I'm a Packers fan, so I got to go with the Packers. All right. All right. I won't hold that against you. Yeah, I, I got to go with the Packers. I wouldn't be upset if the Titans won it because of Mike. I'd be happy for Coach Vrabel, but, um, yeah, my first choice would be the Packers all day. So so, so if it's a packers Titan Super Bowl, where are you at? What are you wearing? I still got, I'm, still, uh, I'm still rooting for the Packers. I started rooting for the Packers when I was. Vrabel might hunt you down here in that. 
Dude, and I would not want that either because that's a tough dude. I want no part of him. I, and I think no Eddie might Eddie might have something to say about that too. That would be the one I'd have a harder time going to get. Like, yeah, I probably have to apologize up front on that. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, they're dudes. They get the game. They love of it, and uh, they'll, they'll respect your loyalty if nothing else. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. So, well, Jamie, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and uh, enlighten us a little bit more about you know your career and and some of the things that you've gotten to do and. Um, you know, with the great game of football and, and how it's impacted you both on and off the field and, and into your professional career. So um, really appreciate the time. Um, we'll definitely have to have you back on a, on a regular basis because I have a feeling um, between the two of us, we could probably burn through a lot of hours just talking stories and, and uh, For sure. uh, we might have to have more beeps in the next round. I don't know. <laughs> so. But with that said, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't done it already, make sure you go um, to your favorite podcast outlet and click follow on Three Dogs and a Dude um, on YouTube as well. You can catch us at the channel is Three Dogs and a Dude, so, or you can hit us up online at Three Dog dot com. So uh, signing off for now, Jamie Sumner. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Stay warm down there. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. One, two, three. Thanks for listening to this episode of Three Dogs and a Dude. Make sure you subscribe to Three Dogs and a Dude at your favorite podcast outlet. Search Three Dogs and a Dude, number three, Dogs and a Dude, at your favorite podcast outlet and give us a follow. You can also find us on the web at threedogdude.com. That's number three, dogdude.com. We look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, for the three dogs, this is their dude signing off. Hip hop.